find it. That's Tom Davis. He's chairman of the House, the House Government Reform Committee, and they're holding this hearing just getting underway. Live coverage here on C-SPAN. Viral infection in the United States, affecting nearly four million Americans. Hepatitis C is also a leading cause of chronic liver disease, now the tenth leading cause of death um, among adults in the United States. In 1998, this committee held a hearing on the need to improve the nation's response to hepatitis C. At that hearing, several specific points of action were recommended. Today, we'll examine what progress has been made in responding to the hepatitis C epidemic. We also hope to identify areas for improvement. Hepatitis C was only uh, identified 15 years ago, so we still have a lot to learn about this disease. We have learned that significant obstacles to fighting hepatitis C exist. There is currently no vaccine to shield against hepatitis C virus. There are vaccines against hepatitis A and B. However, the structure of the hepatitis C virus has proved a difficult puzzle for medical researchers to solve. Today, we will hear from NIH whether it is reasonable to expect the availability of a hepatitis C vaccine in the near future. Pharmaceutical treatments are available but are only successful about 50 percent of the time uh, under ideal conditions. They are also attended by side effects, sometimes so devastating that they often are not an option for many patients with hepatitis C infections. Second, infection with hepatitis C virus generally carries no symptoms but gradually damages the liver over the course of many years or even decades. It is discovered only after a patient exhibits signs of serious liver disease, such as cirrhosis or liver cancer. Since the virus lasts for such a long period of time, it is possible for infected persons to disassociate or even forget about long ago instances of drug use or other high risk behavior. Thus, the individual does not address their own illness, nor do they take steps to stem the spread of the virus to others. A final obstacle is that hepatitis C, while a serious public health issue, remains relatively unknown to the general public. Those affected often come from marginalized populations, intravenous drug users and prisoners, for example, lacking the political organizations to effectively raise public awareness about the disease. Public health officials face the challenge of informing rather than panicking the public about hepatitis C, a task made even more difficult given our still evolving knowledge base. It seems to me that there is a mis uh, misperception that hepatitis C is a disease affecting quote, unquote, somebody else. However, social strata provide uh, no, no prophylaxis. This misperception underscores the need to establish effective programs to educate both health care providers and the public at large about the dangers of hepatitis C and the high-risk activities that tend to spread it. This hearing sets the stage to review our nation's response to hepatitis C. Several questions we would like answered today include, how well are hepatitis C prevention strategies working? Are we screening enough people to identify persons at risk for infection? What progress has been made in the last five years toward the quest for vaccine and developing better and more effective treatments for hepatitis C? How well do Federal agencies share pertinent information among themselves and with State health departments? The current epidemic has challenged our public health system's capabilities and provides us with a chance to evaluate existing prevention, screening and treatment programs. The Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA, has an excellent hepatitis C program and has taken a leading role in managing infection. I am pleased we have a witness on our first panel to discuss the proactive education, screening, treatment, counseling and surveillance measures taken by the VA over the past few years. We will take a look at how these programs are being implemented and what lessons can be provided to the general public health community. In addition to the testimony we will receive from several medical and public health experts, we will hear those the personal story of a teenage girl from Fairfax County whose father has hepatitis C. Erica Stein has helped lead a, a, a marketing program at her high school to raise awareness and get more Federal resources allocated for prevention and research of the disease. We look forward to her testimony. The Committee hopes to learn from the experiences of those who feel the effects of hepatitis C infection every day. I understand some of our witnesses this morning will express concerns about the success of current hepatitis C prevention efforts and identify areas where improvements still needed. I look forward to a constructive dialogue on these concerns. I know we all share the same goal at the end of the day, a public health system that can adequately respond to the hepatitis C epidemic. We have an excellent roster of witnesses today. I want to thank all of them for appearing before the committee. I look forward to their testimony, and I would now like to yield uh, to Mr. Waxman. 
Oh, to Mrs. Norton for her opening statement, and then we'll go to Mr. Waxman. Thanks. Uh, thank Norton. you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Davis, I think you are performing a uh, public service, an unusually important public service. With today's hearing, of course, every hearing is a service to the public, but um, I, I must say the first question that came to me as I prepared for this hearing is, why is this disease such a mystery to me? <laughs> uh, and why is it, I believe, such a mystery to most of the people in this country? And I couldn't help but wonder whether we've been simply sitting on a problem where you have a highly contagious disease like this, which has no vaccine and has no cure, where is the public health campaign and public health outcry about this disease? Why, why am I sitting here, a member of Congress, probably as ignorant about it as uh, the average American? Um, that is very troubling, particularly when you consider the consequences, the contagion, when you don't know about a disease that you can then pass on through intravenous drug use, you really are uh, creating a public health menace that uh, alarm sh should be raised about. People should be put on notice. Um, I, I, today's hearing for me is an opportunity to understand why and what we can do about it very dangerous disease. Almost all the people who have it don't even have any symptoms. So here you are passing along a, a terrible disease. You don't know you have it. Nobody's telling the public about it. Here we're sitting in the most advanced um, uh, country in the world when it comes to uh, health matters, except when it comes to making, uh, of course, health care available to everybody. Um, why is it that we aren't doing more about this disease? Consider some of the consequences. Um, this is one of the disease, diseases that lead to a terrible liver disease, and people who get liver disease need transplants. And about the most expensive way to deal with the disease is to take an organ out and put another in. Um, and yet there's been a five-fold increase, was a five-fold increase in liver transplants in, in the 1990s. Um, I, I wonder uh, whether it is the nature of the disease and the people who have the disease that account for why we know so little about the disease and have done so little about the disease. Um, do we need a Ryan White to get the country's uh, understanding, to get CDC's attention, uh, because that's what it took, frankly, uh, with the AIDS crisis. Um, if so, shame on us. The fact that those who get this disease uh, often are people who use drugs, uh, people who are in prison, um, should say nothing about the attention we pay to the disease. Uh, unless there is a, another explanation, I'm going to have to start with a presumption that it's who gets the disease that is responsible for why we haven't done more about this disease. In any case, Mr. Chairman, you're doing a great deal about it by having a hearing today that may start us on the way to truly raising the consciousness of the American people about hepatitis C. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Waxman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Davis, for calling this hearing today on an important but often overlooked problem. Inside the human body, the hepatitis C virus acts with unusual stealth. Infected individuals may feel fine for years and even decades, and then without warning, hepatitis C can awaken and cause irre irreversible cirrhosis, liver failure, and death. The stealth of the hepatitis C virus also has been evident in the body politic. 
Over the past two decades, our government has missed opportunities to take action to combat hepatitis C and to alert the public to a growing threat. Now we find ourselves facing a chronic blood-borne infection that affects 3 million Americans and kills 8,000 each year. We must first ask what went wrong. Then we must be clear about the opportunities we are missing, even today, to defeat hepatitis C. By 1981, it was known that hundreds of thousands of patients were contracting chronic hepatitis from blood transfusions. Even though the specific virus causing the hepatitis had yet to be identified and there was no specific screening test, blood banks could have taken action to protect the public. Because at the time, research showed that by screening blood for evidence of liver disease in the donor, thousands of cases of transfusion-associated hepatitis could be prevented. Such screening, however, was not required by the Food and Drug Administration, and it was not adopted widely by blood banks until 1987. Two years later, in 1989, the hepatitis C virus was discovered, and a specific greening, screening test was in development. Blood banks and hospitals could have looked back and identified people who had been transfused with infected blood, but FDA decided against requiring such a review. The issue was revisited in the mid-1990s. Under the leadership of HHS Secretary Donna Shalala, the Food and Drug Administration oversaw notification of Americans transfused with tainted blood after 1992. In 1999, FDA proposed extending the no notification back to in individuals transfused prior to 1992. But the current administration has resisted finalizing this potentially life-saving rule. There is a moral issue here. The government has neither required notification of people who did receive tainted blood, nor conducted a broad public education campaign informing everyone about who needs to get tested. The result is that many people have no idea of the risks they face. In 2000, Surgeon General David Satcher sought to write a letter to every American's home about the threat of hepatitis C. His effort was never funded. In 2001, a national hepatitis C strategy was developed. While CDC has begun to pursue important parts of this strategy, many of its elements have yet to be fully funded and implemented. As a consequence, millions of Americans at risk remain unaware of the problem. Many who can benefit from treatment never get it. And even today, many infections that can be prevented are not. According to the Centers for Disease Control, 60% of the new hepatitis C infections are transmitted by intravenous drug use. Yet across our country, many thousands of people who want to get into drug treatment programs, programs that are proven to work, can find no space available to them. Scientific evidence also demonstrates that even those who continue to use drugs can be kept safe from hepatitis C. Two years ago, a consensus panel on hepatitis C convened by the National Institutes of Health recommended, quote, providing access to sterile syringes through needle exchange, physician prescription, and pharmacy sales, end quote. The panel advised that physicians and pharmacists should be educated to recognize that providing intravenous drug users with access to sterile syringes and education and safe injection practices may be life-saving. Yet since then, uh, not much progress in this area has been made. This is an area where right-wing ideology conflicts with sound public health practices. Everyone wants to stop illegal drug use. But because we know that some addicts will continue to use drugs, it's essential to support needle exchange and other life-saving measures. Those who oppose needle exchanges are like those who oppose comprehensive sex education for teenagers, which also has proven to be effective. Public health policy needs to recognize reality and be, be based on facts and science. The infections that we fail to prevent today may not create problems to, for tomorrow, but as the years and decades pass, our society will suffer 
the economic social burden of hepatitis C infections that were entirely preventable. This is a terrible legacy to our children. It's a terrible tragedy for those who are involved. Mr. Chairman, I hope this hearing will shed light on the dangers of the hepatitis C virus. We must work together to generate momentum for legislation to address hepatitis C and to expand access to drug treatment. I thank the witnesses who are going to be here today. Uh, I'm looking forward to their testimony. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Towns, any opening statement? Right. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Beginning in 1995, Representative Chris Shades of Connecticut and I held a series of hearings on bloodborne illnesses and hepatitis C. Our concerns for the safety of the blood supply and the possible transmission of disease through transfusion led us to ask hard questions about the federal policy. During those hearings, we heard the moving testimony of the Honorable Joe Moakley, former chair of the Rules Committee from Massachusetts, who had contracted hepatitis C through a blood transfusion. Unfortunately, he died from the disease within a few years of those hearings. His death showed that hepatitis C could happen to anyone. It made me aware of the fact that education and prevention could not be silent components of the federal public strategy. As a result of those hearings, the Center of Disease Control and Prevention agreed to engage in the first ever public education campaign on hepatitis C, which included a requirement that the CDC take the unprecedented step of notifying those people who may have been infected through blood transfusion. Some public health officials are warning us that the number of deaths from the, this disease will triple in the next decade from the estimate of 8,000 to 10,000 deaths per year to an incredible 24 to 30,000 deaths per year. Because the disease can be dormant for several years and only 30 percent of those who are infected have any symptoms, these estimates may be an understatement. But I am hopeful that we will not have to see such an explosion before we take action. That is why I join with uh, my colleague, Heather Wilson, to introduce H.R. 3539, the Hepatitis C Epidemic Control and Prevention Act. This bipartisan bill will direct the Secretary of Health and Human Services to establish, promote, and support a comprehensive prevention research and medical management referral program. For persons suffering from the hepatitis C virus, if passed, this bill will represent the first federal effort to provide a strategic approach to combat this disease by requiring the development and implementation of a plan for public education. Early detection, testing, and counseling of patients. Mr. Chairman, I know that you are a supporter of this bill, and I want to thank you so much for that. In March of 2004, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, a panel called together by an agency of the Department of Health and Human Services, published recommendations which advise against hepatitis C screening in people who are not in current high-risk categories for the disease. The published recommendations appear to indicate neutrality on whether adults who are high risk should be screened. These recommendations directly contradicted recommendations of the NIH and the current accepted practice in the medical community. Mr. Chairman, may I suggest that we have a hearing on the apparent contradictions within the federal government on these issues of hepatitis C screening. On that note, let me thank you again for holding this hearing and I would like to thank the witnesses as well for being here and to say to you that uh, with you, I hope we can make certain that there is a serious and strategic federal response to hepatitis C. Mr. Chairman, we need to stay on this issue. This is a very serious problem. Well, thank you very back. much for your leadership on this as well, Mr. Townsend. I'm, I'm proud to be a 
a co-sponsor of your bill. Uh, we're going to now move to our first panel of witnesses who will discuss uh, efforts being taken at the federal level to manage the hepatitis C epidemic. They will also describe their efforts to coordinate, uh, educate, uh, screening, treatment, counseling, and surveillance measures. We have Dr. Reem Kabaz, the Associate Director of the National Center for Infectious Diseases. She'll be uh, providing testimony on behalf of the CDC. Dr. Eric Mast, uh, uh, the Acting Director of the Division of Viral Hepatitis at CDC, accompanies uh, Dr. Kabaz, is available to respond to questions. So when we swear in witnesses, uh, we'll have both of them sworn in. Dr. Jay Hoofnagel of the Liver Disease Research Branch at NIH will provide testimony regarding research efforts uh, in search of a vaccine and more effective uh, treatment options. And Dr. Lawrence uh, uh, Deaton, the uh, Chief Counsel of the Public Health uh, Strategic Health Care Group at the Department of Veterans Affairs, will discuss the VA's excellent hepatitis C program. He is accompanied by Dr. Michael Rigby, uh, Rigsby, who is the Director of the National Program Office for HIV and Hepatitis C at the Veterans Health Administration. Dr. Rigsby will also be available to answer questions posed by members, so he will be sworn as well. Would you please rise with me and raise your right hand? You solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, it's our policy that we uh, swear you in before you testify. Um, Dr. Kapaz, I think I'll start with you and we'll move straight on down the line. And I just uh, I thank you very much for your efforts in this area and thank you for being with us today. By the way, we have a, uh, we, we try to keep our, our uh, five minute presentation. Your, entitled, your entire testimony is in the record and questions will be based on the entire testimony. So thank you. You need to push your button there. Okay. Now. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am uh, Dr. Rima Kabaz, Associate Director for Epidemiologic Science at the National Center for Infectious Diseases at the CDC, and I am accompanied today by Dr. Eric Mast, Acting Director of the Division of Viral Hepatitis. We are pleased to be here, and we thank you for the opportunity to describe the activities that CDC has undertaken with our partners to implement the National Hepatitis C Prevention Strategy, which this committee was instrumental in initiating in 1998. Hepatitis C virus, or HCV, is indeed a very serious concern, as it is today the most common cause of chronic liver disease in the United States. It is the most common chronic blood-borne infection. About 4 million Americans have already been infected, of whom approximately 3 million are chronically infected and about 30,000 Americans become newly infected each year. Unlike hepatitis A and hepatitis B, there is no vaccine to prevent infection with HCV. Because the consequences of chronic liver disease from HCV may not become apparent for 10 to 20 years, many infected persons are not aware of their infection. The two major objectives of the National Hepatitis C Prevention Strategy are identification of infected persons and prevention of new infections. These objectives are paramount to reducing the impact of HCV on the public. Identification of HCV-infected persons as well as persons at risk of HCV infection is best achieved through the integration of hepatitis prevention services into community-based clinical and public health programs that serve at-risk persons. Because the majority of persons with hepatitis C do not have symptoms of liver disease, their identification requires that testing be done on persons with risk, risk factors, factors for infection. CDC has conducted a number of community-based uh, demonstration projects called the Viral Hepatitis Integration Projects, or VHIPs, which have shown the feasibility and the effectiveness of including hepatitis prevention services in a variety of clinical and public health settings. I would now like to take a few moments to highlight some specific components of the National Hepatitis C Prevention Strategy. First, as relates to health communications, CDC has developed evidence-based guidelines for identification and testings of persons at risk of hepatitis C. CDC has also provided a broad range of materials about hepatitis C for healthcare professionals and the public. These include web-based continuing medical education programs for healthcare professionals a hepatitis C toolkit for primary care providers and their patients. We have brought with us samples of these materials on the table there and here for those interested. And they can also be found on CDC's website. 
CDC has also funded academic centers, health departments, and non-governmental organizations to carry viral hepatitis education and training activities. Second, with regard to community-based prevention programs, currently CDC funds 53 hepatitis C coordinators in states, large metropolitan areas, and the Indian Health Service. These coordinators work to accelerate the integration of hepatitis C testing, counseling, and referral for medical evaluation into community-based programs that provide clinical and public health services. Among the many activities in which the coordinators engage is the development of comprehensive state hepatitis C prevention plans, and at least 23 states have such a plan at this time. Surveillance is another important component of the prevention strategy because it allows us to monitor trends as well as the effectiveness of prevention efforts. CDC continues to work to develop and maintain enhanced national surveillance systems for hepatitis C, and since 2003, chronic HCV infection has become reportable to CDC. And CDC has developed surveillance guidelines for case investigation and follow-up of persons with chronic HCV infection. And there continue to remain a number of unanswered questions concerning the epidemiology and the natural history of HCV infection. And CDC has a number of studies underway or planned. In conclusion, since 1998, CDC and its partners have made considerable progress in raising awareness about the prevention of hepatitis C, both among healthcare providers and the public. In addition, many states have initiated hepatitis C prevention programs, which are being facilitated by the federally funded hepatitis C coordinators. However, our job is far from complete, and much more remains to be done. Thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to increase awareness about hepatitis C through this hearing, and I will be happy to answer any questions you may Good. have. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hufnagel, thank you for being with us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and of course, one of my staff members has told me about your efforts that they, she thinks uh, helped save her life a couple of years ago. So thank you very much. And, uh, is it on now? It's on. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, my name is Jay Hofnagel, and I'm the director of, of the liver disease research branch for the National Institutes of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, known as NIDDK, one of the institutes at the National Institutes of Health. I'm pleased to be asked to present testimony uh, today on behalf of the NIH and its commitment to research on hepatitis C. As you've heard from Dr. Kabaz, hepatitis C is a very important cause of liver disease. Between 1 and 2 percent of Americans are chronically infected with hepatitis C, and hepatitis C is now the most common cause of chronic liver disease, most common cause of cirrhosis, the major single reason for liver transplantation in adults, and it has become the most common cause of liver cancer in this country and most of the Western world. It's an important issue. But also important, hepatitis C is due to a virus, and as such, this is a potentially preventable, a potentially treatable disease. That means that control of this virus will go a long way to the control of the cirrhosis in this country. We believe, Mr. Chairman, that the greatest promise for ultimate control of hepatitis C will come through advances in biomedical science and biomedical research, advances in the means of diagnosis and evaluation and treatment and prevention of this disease. Indeed, there are few areas of biomedical research at present that are more likely to result in immediate and tangible improvements in the health of Americans than research on hepatitis C. As you know, the mission of the NIH is to advance biomedical research and thereby reduce the burden of disease and improve health of Americans. Hepatitis C is a shared uh, interest at the NIH. Uh, not just by my institute, NIDDK, but also by the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, the National Cancer Institute, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. <clears throat> uh, the activities of the institutes are coordinated through multiple committees. So that in the year, the fiscal year 2004 that's just completed, the estimated total amount of NIH research on hepatitis C, specific to hepatitis C, was $118 million. Importantly, this figure is a major increase 
from what was uh, funded five and 10 years ago. For instance, between 1998 and 2003, the Congress allocated funding that allowed for the doubling of the NIH budget. During the same time, the budget specific for hepatitis C uh, increased almost fivefold, stressing the importance of this research area and the ability of the NIH to allocate funding to emerging uh, conditions of importance. This uh, hearing actually occurs at a particularly special time for liver disease research in that the NIH has just completed a trans-NIH action plan for liver disease research. This is the result of a year of work and input from over 250 investigators, physicians, and laypersons. It covers all of liver disease, but of course, hepatitis C is a major focus of this action plan. The action plan outlaws, outlines some goals and visions for the next five to 10 years of research on liver disease, and some of my testimony will, will, will address the, the goals outlined in that plan. So in this brief uh, introduction, I want to discuss two areas of importance in, in research. The first is treatment, and the second, prevention. As to treatment, the first treatment for hepatitis C was licensed in 1991 as alpha interferon. It's given by injection for six to 12 months. And as originally formulated, this regimen of therapy gave a sustained response in only 10 to 20% of patients at most. During the last five years, we've been fortunate to see several advances in therapy of hepatitis C. The first, the introduction of the antiviral drug ribavirin, and the second, the development of long-acting interferons that, that are given once a week rather than daily or every other day and that are more effective. So that the currently recommended regimen for hepatitis C, the combination of PEG interferon and ribavirin, is effective in 55% of, of patients with hepatitis C uh, who have no other problems with their health. Indeed, in, in subgroups of patients, patients who have different strains of hepatitis C, strain two and three, the response rate is greater than 80%. These results are heartening. Also heartening is the fact that the, what we call a sustained response has now been shown to be durable and long-lasting. Indeed, it appears to be a cure of this viral infection. Well, that's nice in a way, but remember that for 55% of people respond, there are 45% who do not. Furthermore, this treatment is difficult, it's expensive, and has many side effects. Clearly, new approaches to treatment are needed. A major proportion of our portfolio now in funding research on hepatitis C is directed at improving therapy, and industry is also involved in this to a major degree. There have been more than 50 patent applications for new therapies of hepatitis C, and at least six of them are in early human trials. Uh, these are not ready for licensure or approval, Mr. Chairman, but I can assure you that they look very promising. And it's our hope that in the next five to 10 years, we will have therapy for this disease that will be effective in more than 90% of patients and will extend to those difficult to treat populations that are a problem at present. Finally, as to prevention, as you have heard, the CDC uh, currently, uh, there from the CDC, the currently recommendations towards prevention are based on public health measures. Since the discovery of the virus in 1987, there has been a 80% drop in new cases of hepatitis C. It's quite heartening. But since the 1990s, this uh, level of infection has stayed stable, and there's been very little further decrease. Uh, what is needed? Clearly, specific means of treatment are needed, vaccines and globulins that are effective against exposure to hepatitis C. In this regard, major efforts are being made in this area stimulated through uh, workshops, through initiatives, through added funding to request of applications for basic research on development of tissue culture, animal models, and candidate vaccines. Phase one studies of experimental vaccines have been funded, and with the advances in knowledge about the immune system and with the focus on this, on this issue, we believe that uh, a vaccine against this disease will ultimately be available. Mr. Chairman, let me conclude by thanking you for having this hearing, highlighting this very important disease, and express the gratitude of the basic and clinical research community in general for the confidence and trust that the United States Congress has put into us through continued support of the National Institutes of Health and their mission. 
We believe that real progress can be made in the control of uh, hepatitis C, and uh, I would be glad to answer any questions that you have of me on the issue. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Deaton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Hepatitis C has been and continues to be a high priority for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Veterans who use VA for health care are affected by hepatitis C in greater proportion than the nation as a whole. And VA cares for more people with hepatitis C than any other medical system in the country. VA has established a comprehensive approach to hepatitis C similar to that recommended by former Surgeon General Dr. Koop and others in testimony before this committee six years ago. VA's public health approach to hepatitis C contains five integrated components that I will briefly highlight. Number one, screening and testing. Number two, patient and provider education. Number three, access to excellent clinical care. Number four, data-based quality improvement, and number five, research. First, in the area of screening and testing, it is VA policy to provide screening for hepatitis C risk factors for all veterans who receive VA health care and to offer testing for those with risk or anyone who desires to be tested. Since 1999, Mr. Chairman, over 4 million veterans in VA care have been screened for hepatitis C risk factors, and over 200,000 have been diagnosed with hepatitis C infection. A recent external review of over 50,000 medical records showed that over 98% of VA patients have been screened for risk factors, and over 90% of those at risk have been tested for hepatitis C. VA leads the nation in testing for hepatitis C. Our success in screening and testing has its foundation in the second component of our public health approach. That is an aggressive program of patient and provider education. We've provided to your staff examples of our education program, including copies of 29 single topic patient education brochures on hepatitis. We've distributed literally millions of these brochures throughout the VA healthcare system in order to inform veterans about hepatitis C. We've partnered with veteran service organizations and various advocacy groups to promote hepatitis C awareness. We've also conducted an aggressive provider education program, including giving grand round lectures on hepatitis C at nearly every VA hospital in the nation. We have held national education conferences attended by nearly 1,000 VA health care providers. We have developed recommendations on hepatitis C treatments and distributed them in print and electronic form, on pocket cards, and by software downloadable into providers' handheld PDAs. In addition, we've identified a lead hepatitis C clinician in every VA hospital around the country. These are our main points of contact to transmit education and treatment updates. Identification of veterans infected with hepatitis C who use VA health care system necessitates the third component of our public health approach, and that is excellent clinical care. Excellent clinical care for hepatitis C includes one, careful medical assessment of liver function. Two, identification of and treatment of important comorbidities, especially mental health, substance use disorders, and HIV infection. The third area is providing antiviral drug therapy when indicated with close medical monitoring during the six to 12 months of therapy and treatment of its frequent side effects, which Dr. Hoofnagel mentioned. The fourth area is management and prevention of complications associated with cirrhosis and end-stage liver disease when they occur. And finally, liver transplantation when no other options exist. The VA's Hepatitis C Resource Centers program works to improve clinical care, including regular updating of our antiviral treatment recommendations, expanding the population of patients who can be safely treated for hepatitis C, increasing skills of our liver specialists in managing the psychiatric complications of hepatitis C treatment and in managing cirrhosis and end-stage liver disease, and expanding the cadre of healthcare providers trained to deliver hepatitis C care beyond liver specialists who are in very short supply to include primary care providers, mid-level practitioners, and clinical pharmacists, as well as development of guidelines for establishing hepatitis C patient and family support groups, so important in successful care. 
Antiviral therapy is not recommended for all hepatitis C patients, and some who are eligible turn it down because of the potentially severe side effects, long duration of therapy, and relatively poor success rates of the currently available drugs. Recently, VA has treated approximately 9,000 veterans each year with antiviral medications for their hepatitis C infection. In addition, VA has an active liver transplant program. Last year, over 400 veterans were evaluated for possible liver transplant, and VA performed 87 liver transplants. VA's National Electronic Medical Record System allows us a unique opportunity to undertake the fourth component of our public health program for hepatitis C, that is data-based quality improvement. In 2000, we established the National VA Hepatitis C Case Registry. This reg registry tracks in a confidential manner the detailed medical data on VA patients who have tested positive for or have been diagnosed with hepatitis C. This information helps both our national program and our local clinicians improve the quality of patient care. Through the end of fiscal 2004, over 273,000 veterans have been added to that registry. This is the largest organized prospective collection of clinical data on persons with hepatitis C in the world. The final component of the VA public health program in hepatitis C is to promote and support research to improve the health of veterans living with hepatitis C. In fiscal 2003, VA funded 15 projects at a cost of more than $2.4 million, and VA investigators leveraged over $4.1 million in non-VA funding to support 104 different hepatitis C research projects. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman and committee members, VA's comprehensive public health approach to hepatitis C has been successful in achieving the goals outlined to this committee six years ago. VA's approach to hepatitis C has elements that may be useful for other large health care systems, for health insurance companies, employers, public health departments, private practitioners, and the public at large. While proud of these accomplishments, we recognize much remains to be done to identify veterans with hepatitis C and provide them with the best medical care possible. That is our commitment to serve the men and women who have served our nation so nobly. This concludes my remarks. Dr. Rigsby and I will hap would be happy to answer any questions about the VA program. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank all of you for your, for your testimony and your work in this area. Um, Dr. Kabaz, let me start with you. Uh, when HIV AIDS was emerging, as was noted before, and this is true with other, other diseases, a lot more information and publicity uh, were available about the disease uh, that seems to be lacking in this instance, despite some, some efforts on your part and others to try to increase awareness of this and uh, some of the preventive measures that people can take. Uh, what do you attribute that to, and, and do you have any thoughts about how we change it? Yeah, thank you, Congressman, for, for the question. Um, the, uh, the, the, the HCV is by and large thought of being a silent epidemic, and this is because what we alluded to in terms of a large number of people with asymptomatic infections, um, in terms of the acute uh, phase of the infection, and, and um, 75 to 85% of those go on to develop chronic infection, and then a subset develop uh, chronic uh, disease. Um, so it has been around with us for a long time, undetected. Um, the, uh, as part of the uh, National Hepatitis C Prevention Strategy, as I mentioned, identification of, of infected persons, prevention of new disease um, uh, and new infections are important, and, and uh, part of that strategy is, is putting information putting information out, and CDC has been working um, to put such information. I mentioned the brochures and the fact sheets, and, and we've worked with, with partners as well to, to develop uh, educational materials, both for healthcare providers and for, for the public. Well, do you think there are thousands of people walking around that are infected now that have no idea because they haven't, the symptoms haven't appeared yet? Well, that, that's one element is, is the material out there, but also, as I alluded to in my remarks, uh, the um, the um, 
best approach to, to reaching those people is uh, integration of prevention programs into uh, uh, hepatitis prevention programs into existing clinical and, and public health programs. And, uh, and, and we've initiated, we've initiated that. Um, you know, only 23 states um, have comprehensive hepatitis C prevention plans today. That's a good way to get at it is to get the states involved. We had trouble getting a state medical officer here today to testify. Uh, I know they're handling a lot of different emergencies and so on. Uh, but that's a, that, that is a problem. And that's something I think mean, we can look at it from this area is trying to put some incentive or some stick in the hands of these states uh, so that they wake up to it. Would that be helpful? Yeah, as I mentioned in, in, in my remarks, I think there's, there's more to be done. Um, CDC has funded, uh, and I mentioned those, the hepatitis C coordinators, 53 of them in state health departments and large metropolitan area, and we have one with the Indian Health Service. And, and uh, one important function of these uh, coordinators is work to develop uh, prevention uh, uh, plans, um, comprehensive prevention plan. Uh, correct, 23 states have those plans, and five other states are, are developing plans. Um, CDC also provides assistance to states, and, and, and some of the plans and, and, uh, are, are shared, um, available on the website, and, and, and shared uh, with uh, states um, uh, to develop uh, uh, their own plans. Okay. Uh, mo more okay. needs to be done. Uh, Dr. Hufnagel, currently there's no vaccine against hepatitis C. Um, why in the age of preventive medicine is it so hard to develop an effective hepatitis C vaccine? And do you think it's realistic to expect a vaccine within the next five to ten years? Uh, and what could we do to help that along? Is it a funding issue? I mean, what are some of the variables? Well, the, the problem is with the virus and how you respond to it. The difficulty is that if, you re if you're one of those lucky people who recover from hepatitis C, only about 30 percent of people recover, you're not protected against reinfection. The antibody in, in hepatitis C that's made, this is just nature, that's not something we did, uh, is not very protective. So if, uh, if nature can't do it, how can we come along and do better? Well, one clue is that 30 percent of people recover. Why do they recover? It appears to be not just antibody, the usual thing that we stimulate with a vaccine, like hepatitis A or B vaccine, you get antibody. Maybe you also have to stimulate T cells or other forms of the immune system to clear the virus. This is the kind of new information that's arising, that perhaps you can't get sterilizing immunity, but you can induce parts of the immune system so that the person who's exposed and gets infected will recover on their own. And I'm a little optimistic about the, a vaccine being available. I think it might not be the typical type of vaccine, the hepatitis A or B vaccine, but it would be a vaccine that promotes recovery. And that might be almost as good as a, a regular vaccine. Th thank you very much. Mr. Waxman. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're dealing with a disease that people wouldn't realize they had for years, maybe even decades. Is that right? That's correct. And yes. it suddenly would take hold? How would it manifest itself if somebody had a, an activated, reactivated uh, hepatitis C? Well, uh, hepatitis C uh, is a long drawn out disease. It causes inflammation and damage to the liver. You don't feel your liver very much with inflammation. It's not like a sore throat or a skin rash. You don't see it until the liver is fairly badly damaged. And the problem is, at that point, it may be a little bit late to do something or to treat. So if we wait for symptoms to appear, we're waiting for the point that the liver is starting to fail, and you really need to do something about this disease while there's just inflammation and a little bit of damage to the liver. And that's the challenge. There are blood tests that show that the liver is being, is inflamed. And uh, ways to, easy screening test for those. So the, uh, the, the the, the obvious public health matter before us is to try to get to the people who may have <clears throat> hepatitis C and get them in to be tested and get them into treatment before the symptoms manifest themselves. Uh, Dr. Kabaz, there was a group of people who had blood transfusions prior to 1992. It's a discrete group. We know who had blood transfusions prior to 1992. The, the FDA had recommended, I guess the FDA 
uh, did not recommend a look back to uh, notify those people who had these blood transfusions prior to 1992. Many of them may be infected and not realize it. From a medical standpoint, wouldn't it be valuable to let these people know they might have hepatitis C and that they should do something about it? Uh, I, uh, yes, I, I think, uh, as, as I mentioned, part of the hepatitis C prevention strategy, one an important component is identifying people who are infected. And, and uh, you're correct, Congressman Waxman, a limited look back was, was initiated. Um, however, um, the thought was that um, it, w it was difficult to reach people, most of the people infected, um, in terms of when you look at um, blood transfusion basically before the mid-80s when a nonspecific test was introduced. Before that, there was quite a bit of transmission via blood. And then until 92, when the specific hepatitis C test was, was introduced is when the transmission dropped to less than one in a million um, unit transfuse, which is where we are today. So um, the, um, um, the, uh, um, to reach those people and reach the other um, groups at risk, uh, one, of, one of the um, important thing is to make sure that clinicians, healthcare providers routinely ask about risk factors, transfusion and others, and then offer the test as, as, as you've alluded to people. Well, I suppose if people went in for medical care, they, they might get this routine test as part of their physical examination. But as I understand it, most of the people now who have uh, hepatitis C are, are, are IV drug users. That seems to be the 60 percent of the people who have uh, hepatitis C. I doubt many of them come in for medical care. I know CDC is trying to reach people and inform them. If you have a group that could be contacted directly, it seems to me there's a moral argument to contact them. If you don't do that, a strong argument then is to have a public education campaign. If, if a CDC had more money, uh, would you be putting money into uh, 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 trying to inform the public of the risks that they may be having with hepatitis C and get them in for the tests? Uh, let me make a few comments, and perhaps Dr. Eric Mast um, may, may want to add to them. Um, in terms of reaching people and, and reaching the high-risk groups that, that we know of for hepatitis C, um, you know, we feel that, that people do see providers for a number of reasons. So, so basically the approach to educate healthcare providers, not just in the private sector, the uh, public sector as well, and, and the, pro the projects, demonstration projects that we've had, um, uh, the uh, viral hepatitis integration projects, um, um, to, to provide um, um, care, you know, uh, screening and, and testing and then, and, uh, and then for patients for management and, and, and all that sort of thing. Within the context of, um, of programs that provide care, a comprehensive approach has uh, shown to be feasible and effective. So that's one component of the strategy. Now, there's also public Let education me, uh, material that we've put out. You mentioned that they're available for us. 30,000 um, separate material are requested from the CDC every Let month. Let me interrupt you because the light is on. I have time for maybe one more question, and I wanted to ask uh, uh, Dr. Hofnagel, a question, because it seems to me that one of the strategies ought to be, especially if we have all these IV drug users, we ought to discourage them from using drugs, which means get them into treatment programs. But secondly, if they're not going to be into a treatment program because a pre program's not available, wouldn't it be s wise for us to have them use uh, clean syringes and have the government make that available? That was one of the recommendations uh, that was given uh, by the uh, National Institutes of Health uh, 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 group that, that looked at this whole problem. Don't you think that would make sense from a public health point of view? Yes. I have to defer to my CDC people about public health okay. issues. The consensus conference was not officially the federal government. They are an independent panel the federal government calls together. Well, that makes it even more credible, doesn't it? It does, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and they recommended that we have a, a clean syringe program. Well, Dr. Kabar, uh, do, you want to, uh, do you want to respond to that in the, in the time that I don't have available to me? <laughs> yeah, in terms of, of uh, direct treatment centers, I mean, they are, they are um, this is where, uh, uh, this is a good place for primary and secondary prevention for um, uh, hepatitis and other blood-borne infections. Um, to my understanding, in terms of the um, uh, 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 harm reduction uh, interventions and all that, um, while they make sense, um, they has been shown to be effective for HIV. I think the data is still lacking for HCV, although I make 
it, there's some differences in the epidemiology when you look at drug users in terms of even though they have they're all blood-borne infections, but in terms of who gets them and, and how um, there are some epidemiologic differences out there. Um, HCV and HPV, quickly after starting drug use, people get them, whereas it takes a long time to get well, HIV. Would sterile syringes and, uh, and safe injection practices decrease the public health problem for HIV and hepatitis C? You know, all, all uh, harm reduction, um, you know, strategies and, and, and comprehensive prevention programs um, to drug users um, would seem to, to um, you know, um, empirically to make a difference, I would think. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Watson. Ms. Norton. <clears throat> you know, I really bothered when, when I have great respect for science in this, in this country, and I, I'm, I'm bothered if we can't get a straight answer on, uh, on uh, Mr. Waxman's uh, question. Y you know, if something is transmitted by, <laughs> can be transmitted by dirty needles, the question is, you say to a scientist, you say to a doctor, would it be better to have an exchange of clean needles? Now, I, I want to quote from the NIH consensus panel urged the government to institute measures to reduce transmission of hepatitis C virus among intravenous drug users, including providing access to sterile syringes through needle exchange, physician prescription, and pharmacy sales. Now, may I just ask both of you, do you, do you agree with that recommendation? of the NIH consensus panel. I'm asking you as doctors, do you agree with that or are you in disagreement with what this panel has said? No, I'm in agree agreement that that would be a good policy. Thank you. Dr. Cabaz, are you <clears throat> in agreement or disagreement with what these experts in this field have said? Again, I said this. I, I think I don't disagree with, with as I told Congressman Waxman, that that um, you know those and other harm reduction interventions make sense, and, and that they would be um, that they would be helpful. I don't for hepatitis C specifically. And, and um, Dr. Mast, uh, feel free to uh, add to my comments. I'm not aware of specific data that shows that they are effective. You know, so these are, this is what these this well, is what the, this panel has said. I mean, the reason I ask is because it's very bothersome. You know, the one, one group of people I expect to give a straight answer is the people who base their information on science. I'm not asking you whether you're for it. I'm not asking you for whether you're against it. I'm asking you whether this is a matter, a, a way of preventing the spread of what you yourself, Dr. Kabazi, have said is a silent killer. Yeah, well, now, I, well, you know, I'm asking you as a doctor, and I'm asking you as a scientist, and Dr. Mast, if you want him to, 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 well, the gentleman, let me ask unanimous consent to give you an additional minute, and then I'd like to throw in something okay. into the mix. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that uh, the gentlelady from the district be given an additional minute to her five minutes, and then I'm just to intervene a kind of an opine a question. This is an issue we have fought over up here, needle exchange programs, and argued about, particularly with the District of Columbia, as, as the gentlelady knows. I've always had a, some concern that if you're a, a veteran, you go to a veteran's hospital, we charge you for a needle. If you're an average Joe, you go to a hospital, they charge you for a needle. If you're on Medicare, they charge you for a needle. But if you're using illegal drugs, they give you a free needle in terms of what are the policy implications of that. We've, and yet we understand that obviously using a clean needle is better for you than using a dirty needle. And, uh, you know, we agonize over this. And in different parts of the country, jurisdictions react differently. I think the way we dealt with it in the district was we decided they could do what they wanted to with their own money and that we wouldn't use federal money, and it seemed to, to work itself out, but not without a lot of debate and consternation. And, and I think they're just trying to get the question is, and, and maybe you're not in a position to overall uh, say what the ramifications are to the message of giving out free needles when you're trying to stop people from using drugs altogether, but clearly a cleaner needle is better than a dirty needle. And I guess that it's in that context that you're trying to get an answer. Is that fair? Yes. Yes. But we, we argue about this, too, because you have competing policy goals. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. Okay. I agree. Well, let, let me let, let me move on. Uh, I'm looking for a, the, 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 I'm looking for a way to get at the, the silent killer. I, I was interested in the testimony of Dr. 
Kabaz, uh, um, current a a antiviral treatment completely eliminates uh, the infection in 50 to 55 percent of selected patients, and 95 percent of those, uh, with 95 percent of those remaining free for for uh, virus free for five years. That would seem to put a premium on getting to people before this progresses to liver disease and uh, all the attending consequences. So I'm looking for signs of a uh, national campaign. Um, and I spoke of my own ignorance about this disease in my opening comments. And I looked, I think it's toward this, I think it's your testimony, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Hufnagel, uh, about uh, outreach and public education efforts and it, 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 the testimony of page seven talks about um, um, coordinating focus provided by the National Digestive Diseases Information Clearinghouse. I kind of don't understand that, but perhaps you can explain why that's a clearinghouse. I guess I don't much care, but that's interesting. I didn't think of this as a digestive disease. But moving right along, including the involvement of multiple NIH agencies, other federal agencies, professional lay organizations such as the American Association, da, 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 and all the online, you have two NIH websites. I can't find a focus for this disease. I can't find somewhere in NIH or in, uh, in, in CDC, somewhere in the federal government where somebody regards it as his mission to educate the public that they are wa that many that millions are walking around with this silent disease, or, or to tell people that we actually can do a great deal if you get to us early, uh, as your testimony has indicated. So I'm looking for who it is who is in charge of helping us to spread the word, to eliminate <clears throat> the disease, this disease, to get people into treatment, and the rest of it. Well, the. Uh what you're referring to there is the uh, NIDDK Digestive Disease Clearinghouse, which is the mechanism we use to provide information to people, to physicians, doctors interested in the diseases that we're involved with as far as research. It is not, uh, a, it is not mandated to, uh, as an educational program to go out to all Americans. It's uh, largely a, a mechanism that we use to get out information. Well, who is it that's in charge of getting the word out to average Joes like the people on this panel? Well, I, I turn to my yeah. colleagues here at the CDC again about there. Yeah, yeah, I've alluded to the efforts that we have in the uh, health communication arena. Let me just expand. I, I already mentioned we have uh, the brochures and, and posters and pamphlets and information on hepatitis C for healthcare providers and for the public are available and have been translated into Spanish and, and Russian. And about 30,000 separate pieces of, of uh, such educational material are actually distributed each month on request mm -hmm. to public and, and doctors. There's also a toolkit that uh, was developed uh, uh, for physicians and their uh, patients, and about 140 3,000 providers have received this toolkit. There's a hotline. Um, there, there's also uh, the uh, CDC funds cooperative agreements with uh, non-governmental organization, academic centers, and, and the health departments to develop training and education materials so, uh, and, and uh, to evaluate them. And, and so there's a lot of material being developed by CDC and by partners and others. Um, I would also mention the roundtable that CDC has initiated to bring together all the partners working on, on, on in this arena, um, governmental and non-governmental organization, to make sure that we're um, all coordinated in terms of information and, and, and uh, approach uh, uh, to, to okay. prevention. Thank you. Okay. You want to, this is our last question. We'll go ahead and answer if you want to. It, uh, Ms. Norton, we, we agree with you that um, health education and communication is a major component of the national hepatitis C uh, prevention strategy, and CDC has developed a broad range of materials, um, both for the general public, uh, for persons at risk, and for health care providers. We've um, uh, done our best to make those materials accessible uh, to people, and we'll continue to do our best to make those ex materials accessible to people. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Towns? Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin with you, Dr. Kavaz. Uh, why is it that CDC does not require all states 
to provide surveillance on hepatitis C? Um, it's an important question. Um, let me, uh, um, there's, there's actually surveillance uh, for hepatitis C has a number of components. Um, with regard to acute hepatitis, acute hepatitis C, um, it is reportable actually. And uh, the organization that makes the disease reportable is not CDC, it's the Council and state of State uh, and Territorial Epidemiologists that actually um, rep have a representative of state epidemiologists the ones who decide on a disease being reportable, and then states um, adopt this recommendation. So acute hepatitis C has been reportable for many years, and, and so we gather and, and, and put out reports and, and follow trends of disease. And in 2003, actually, working with the Council and State Territorial Epidemiologists, CSTE, um, hepatitis, chronic hepatitis C viral infection has also become reportable. And 19 states have actually uh, provided reports. Um, there are challenges to doing chronic hepatitis C um, virus uh, surveillance in terms of gathering states. and verifying these reports. And, and uh, you know, clearly more states need to come on board and, and, and um, um, that work is, is going on to, to train and to provide um, investigation material and all. It, it's, um, so, so we've made progress, but there's, there's, there's more to do, as, as I mentioned um, earlier. You know, let me just say, I, I, I don't feel there's a sense of urgency here. You know, I, I hate to say that. You know, but I, you know, just sort of casually, 19 states out of the 50, you know, maybe uh, the next year there'll be 20, you know, and, and uh, just sort of casual kind of, you know, thing, and that really bothers me because we're talking about a life and death issue. And uh, I just sort of, I'm, I'm disturbed by it. Let me ask again, uh, uh, in your testimony, uh, you note that states have initiated uh, uh, hepatitis C prevention programs and that these programs use federal funds. Let me ask this, um, the number of states that you have such programs you indicated, the amount of federal funds allocated per program, uh, could you tell me that? The amount of money allocated. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have the numbers uh, with me, but we'd be glad to give you those, those uh, right. numbers. Mr. Chairman, could we leave the record open to receive that information? Yeah, could, you, could you try to get that to the committee and that'll be, we'll keep the record open for that. Thank you. Well, the other question is, uh, do states have to match these funds? Uh, my understanding, and, and Dr. Mast may want to may um, uh, elaborate some more, is that uh, these funds are made available through cooperative agreements, so states do not have to match funds. Funds are made available to support uh, programs uh, in uh, prevention, uh, state coordinators, education and surveillance. Now, uh, states, um, many states have, have actually uh, put in funds and, and, and uh, supplemented those uh, federal resources to carry um, hepatitis C um, uh, prevention activities, uh, but they're not mandated uh, to, to do so. The, ba the basic concept is we fund a single hepatitis C uh, coordinator in every state, and their responsibility is to integrate hepatitis C activities into existing uh, state programs. So they, they work with other uh, communicable disease programs with um, STD, HIV, uh, programs to integrate hepatitis C uh, activities into existing state programs. So that's the concept that we're promoting. So one of the reason I'm asking this, I'm trying to figure out why every state would not want to have one. Yeah, there are, uh, we've offered uh, funding to all states to have a hepatitis C coordinator and uh, all but two states have uh, requested and are currently funded uh, for having hepatitis C. Can we just C ask which two states have an answer? Yeah, yes, which two states? Uh, the two states that currently don't are uh, Kentucky and uh, South Dakota. Thank you. Um, let me, uh, yeah, Dr. Hufnagel, um, can you tell us about the Federal Interagency Working Group? I need to know a little more about that Hepatitis C Working Group. Well, the Hepatitis C Working Group is an informal group of people from each of the institutes that funds research on Hepatitis C. 
that get together to coordinate our initiatives. If we have a new idea, like say, put together a workshop to see which other institutes would be interested in contributing. Now, uh, I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, so thank you very much. Well, it, it, thank you very much. L let me uh, just thank this panel. We've got another panel uh, we're going to go to and hear from them, some, some of the personal uh, stories. But I want to just thank you all for uh, continuing Chairman, could, this. Could I, could I ask one moment of, uh, could I ask? Without this? objection, Ms. Norton, you can ask another question. 60% um, uh, of, the reason I asked about a national campaign, um, uh, it, it, uh, has to do with the statistics that show that 60 percent of, of those uh, infected are, HI, are intravenous uh, drug uh, users. Um, I, 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 I hope that you will take back to CDC, particularly given your answer on what kind of campaign you're conducting, posters and the rest of it. You know, a lot of these people in jail, they're going to come home to communities like the District of Columbia. They're going to come home to the big cities and spread this disease. And we don't know anything about this disease in this city. Their own congresswoman doesn't know anything about it. And, and, and I, would, I would imagine that I'm like many other members of Congress and many other people uh, who run cities. And I, I am just going to ask you, um, based on your testimony today, whether you would take back to CDC the need to do a real national campaign so that we can uh, apparently make available treatment which could keep this disease from progressing. One, you have testified it's a preventable disease, and, and I have to tell you, I don't think you're doing anything to help us prevent this disease with even those of us who ought to know better, do not know. Uh, and, and we need a campaign to reach people who are in jail, to reach people who are inclined to take drugs, uh, and campaigns about posters uh, and the rest of it clearly are not doing the job as these figures go up. And I just have to leave you with that message and hope you will take it back uh, and try to come forward with a campaign. And, and let me just ask uh, uh, Dr. Deaton, we didn't really get into the success you've had at the VA on this, but what elements of VA's hepatitis C program could be exported to the general public, do you think? Well, certainly, uh, Chairman Davis, the, the uh, educational materials that we've developed and distributed uh, throughout the VAs around the country for both patients, their families, and providers are publicly available. They're on our website, and we're happy to make them available to anyone else. Uh, I so think we don't have to reinvent the wheel in this case? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, and and, and it, these materials are already being used by CDC and NIH. There's, it's just a matter, I think, of getting it in the right hands. And I have to say, I think that the the VA success, uh, and we've still got a ways to go, but the VA success is, uh, it's a multi-component issue. It's, it's the screening and testing, it's the education, it's the care, but it's a partnership, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, between the healthcare system and the public and our national leadership uh, and advocacy groups. We in the VA have been very lucky that this is an issue that um, uh, the veterans uh, service organizations, Vietnam Veterans of America, and, and, and specific advocacy groups around this issue, uh, some of which are here in this room today, uh, have been passionate about for some time. And it's given us a lot of external support to do what we knew we needed to do. And so I, I think it's a, it's a marriage, sir, and, uh, and many components, including leadership. Uh, from communities, from governors, from um, uh, uh, health directors, health department directors, et cetera, are very important to, to get this important uh, disease into the public's mind. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Dr. Dayton's point, I think, is well taken, but I would point out that the veterans' uh, system, health care system, is an integrated approach to screening, diagnosis, and treatment. And if for people who are not part of the VA, uh, it doesn't work like a system. Others with hepatitis C, even if they even have insurance, even if they have health insurance, often struggle to get the care they need. We don't often find ourselves in an integrated health care model. Uh, the, the, I would like to ask uh, two things for the record. Uh, uh, Dr. Kabaz, there was a national hepatitis C strategy, and I'd like to have you supply for us uh, what elements of the strategy have not yet been implemented because I assume that everything has not yet been implemented, otherwise we wouldn't be holding a hearing right. today about the, how this problem is still a, um, 
a major concern. Mm -hmm. And then uh, thirdly, and you, just, you can follow up on that. We'll put it in the record. Yes. So. So this will be furnished to us for the record of those elements of the strategy that uh, have not yet been fully implemented or funded. And then uh, thirdly, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Cummings and I recently wrote NIH Director Dr. Zerhouni about harm reduction, and I would ask that his response on the effectiveness of harm reduction be placed into the record uh, for today's hearing. Uh, without objection. Thank no you very much. Let me ask uh, also yeah, from Tim. the record as well. Of the 118 million, uh, uh, Dr. Hoovenagel, uh, how much was actually spent for the record? You don't have to tell me today for the record. And what kind of coordination exists between NIDDK and the other agencies and institutes within NIH that are doing hepatitis C research? How are these research dollars being used? Can you give me some percentage on the amount devoted to basic research, the amount devoted to treatment, the amount devoted to developing a vaccine. I'd be delighted if you would submit that for the record. And we'll try to get that as well, and included. Any other comments anybody want to make? If not, uh, you don't have to. Let me. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I just wanted to thank you for, for bringing visibility to hepatitis C, and I want to thank Ms. Stein for her interest and, and for bringing us She's here today. She's been great. We're going to hear her on the next person. panel, but uh, she and, and, a, and a group at Robinson uh, High School are trying to do. Well, thank you all very much. We'll take a three minute to break and move to the next panel. House Government Reform Committee looking at hepatitis C and what the federal government is doing to fight it. They're in a short break in between panels. We expect the next one to start in just a minute or two. The second one will feature a Virginia student whose father has hepatitis C. Her name is Erica Stein, and it should get underway shortly.
We're ready to move to the second panel. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for appearing. Uh, invited to join us in our second panel is Dr. Michael Rudman, the founder of the Frederick County Hepatitis Clinic. Dr. Rudman will provide the committee with an assessment of current federal efforts to combat uh, hepatitis C. Ms. Ann Jesse, uh, the founding executive director of the Hep C Connection. She's here to discuss the potential costs of an inadequate response to hepatitis C and support systems available to people living with the disease. Uh, Captain John Nemec, uh, the first vice president of the Fairfax County Professional Firefighters and Paramedics, is going to discuss the risks posed to first responders and the necessity uh, of education about the disease. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Ms. Erica Stein from Robinson Secondary School is with us today to tell her personal story of her efforts to raise awareness and increase funding of prevention and research of hepatitis C. And uh, we have some of your Robinson classmates here with you today. Well, if they just uh, stand up, could we have you stand up and just say uh, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> we waited till two for the hearing so they could get a full day of class in ahead of time, <laughs> but. Uh, or almost of them. Uh, Dr. Rodman, why don't we start with you and we'll move on uh, down. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, uh, Chairman Davis, for giving me the opportunity to share with you something of what it's like to provide medical care for people with hepatitis C and to share with you my assessments of the effectiveness of the current federal efforts to Dr. Rodman, I've just been reminded I need to swear all of you and if you just rise with me quickly and raise your right hands. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, you can proceed. Since March of 2000, I've been the medical director of the Frederick County Hepatitis Clinic. This is a small, not-for-profit, community-based organization in central Maryland that has provided comprehensive medical care to victims of hepatitis C, care without regard to insurance or financial status. We have now treated over 1,000 patients for hepatitis C, most of them coming from marginalized populations that have no other access to care. Our patients come from as far away as Colorado, Florida, Tennessee, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and the extremes of Maryland. They come because they are sick or because they're afraid or both, and they come to us because they have no else, no, nowhere else to go. The majority of people with hepatitis C will not seri uh, uh, suffer serious effects from the disease. However, a significant minority will. Dr. J.B. Wong and others have projected that in the decade of 2010 to 2019, 190,000 Americans will die of this disease. And this will represent a loss of 1.83 million years of human life under the age of 65. Dr. Wang's group modeled the economic cost of the epidemic and put it at $75 billion in healthcare and societal costs. Now that's for the decade to come. This decade will be almost that high. 20% of the people with chronic hepatitis will get cirrhosis. That represents 540,000 Americans. Reducing the disability and death from HCV is the goal of our clinic. Each number represents a human life, a human life, a world full of sensibilities and possibilities. It seems like everyone uh, I talk to sees this as a question of money or the lack of it. Le let me tell you what our clinic in Frederick County has done with an annual budget of sixty to seventy thousand dollars, with one full-time employee, with a few part-timers, and a bunch of hard-working uh, volunteers. Last year, thanks to our strategic partners, including Frederick County physicians, the Frederick Memorial Hospital, the Frederick County Health Department, Sharing Plow, Roche and other pharmaceutical companies, uh, and a grant from our Board of County Commissioners, our clinic distributed $1.5 million in goods and services to, uh, to our target populations. As small and as fragile as we are, the clinic is now one of Maryland's largest hepatitis providers and is the only source of comprehensive hepatitis care dedicated to Maryland's uninsured and underinsured. 
Imagine what could be done with adequate funding. Most federally funded HCV studies have not carefully examined how the disease is expressed in marginalized populations. Indeed, many of these people were excluded from the NHANES survey, upon which our current estimates of disease prevalence are based. These people are truly invisible, both to the federal government and to academia. They are also where the burden of this disease, its prevalence, uh, prevalence, disability, and mortality is concentrated. Our clinic targets these special populations infected with hepatitis C. The poor and working poor, the chemically dependent, the mentally ill, and HIV co-infected. They comprise a little over half of our clientele. And our experience in dealing with special populations suggests that HCV tends to be especially virulent in them. That is more likely to produce disability and death. Effective interventions, such as screening, education, vaccination, and treatment, may reap even larger benefits in this population than in the general public. When each client first arrives at our clinic, we do a comprehensive health assessment. One of every 16 people arrives at their first visit with end-stage liver disease, too late for much of anything except comfort measures, transplantation, or death. Our goal was to prevent this from happening in the other 15. We educate, counsel, and support our clients. People who are headed for cirrhosis get antiviral therapy. Of the clients that our clinic selects for treatment, 48% have the most severe stages of viral hepatitis, stage three and stage four fibrosis. This is an important indication of just how sick this individual, uh, this, this invisible population is. There are hundreds of thousands of people all over the country with stage three and stage four liver disease right now that are not getting any counseling, not getting any treatment. Our clients often have a history of substance abuse and or psychiatric problems, and we have to optimize treatment for these co-occurring illnesses prior to, during, and after treatment. This is the challenge and the dividend of treating HCV in special populations. The way we look at it, helping our patients to become healthy means more than just curing hepatitis C. Because antiviral treatment can be difficult, we provide a lot of support for our clients, and the result is that 85% of those who start therapy finish it, and the majority of them who finish it eliminate the virus permanently. For them, a treatment is a once and done deal. Today, HCV is the only chronic viral infection that can be called curable. Chairman Davis, you asked for my comments on the federal efforts to combat this disease. Your Honor, if I could use your combat metaphor, let me describe the situation from the point of view of a lowly platoon leader in the battlefield of HCV. Sir, our troops are getting hammered. The battle plans that have been drawn up by, in the form of NIH consensus statements and CDC guidelines have not been implemented. The few units that remain in action must scrounge for food and ammo in the wilderness. And let me you know, uh, illustrate these points from my experience as a Maryland physician. The state of Maryland, mind you, is not a poor state. We are national leaders in, in biomedical research and in medical education. Our governor, Robert Ehrlich, a distinguished former member of the House of Representatives, is Maryland's first governor to, to begin addressing hepatitis C. And we're very excited about this. However, let me share with you a few surprising facts about the condition, the past, present, and future of HCV in Maryland, a condition which our governor, or state of affairs, I should say, which our governor inherited. I serve as a current member on Governor Ehrlich's Hepatitis Advisory Council, and I have learned a lot about how Maryland sees this epidemic. HCV is Maryland's second most common reported infectious disease. It already has infected 100,000 Marylanders, of at least, and of, of which, or of whom, at least 20,000 will develop cirrhosis and 5,000 will die. It will cost the state over $2 billion in healthcare and societal costs over the coming years. 
Yet Maryland's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, following the federal government's lead on HCV, has not one person in the entire government designated to work on HCV, not one. We do not have a hepatitis coordinator. In the 16 years since the, since the virus has been identified, the state of Maryland has yet to spend $1 for HCV control or HCV education. Maryland presently denies 90% of its 8 to 10,000 HCV infected prisoners access to any screening, any education, or treatment. Maryland for HCV. Maryland does get federal funds to treat HCV in co-infected patients, that is, patients with HIV. You see, HCV is a major cause of death in HIV patients, and the federal government provides funding for HIV, and some of that can be used to treat HCV, but only if you have HIV. HCV patients who don't have HIV get nothing. They have the right to remain permanently silent, the right to die of a treatable disease. Congress can improve its efforts in combating HCV and other infectious diseases by addressing the process by which healthcare funding is allocated, making certain that the diseases that are the most prevalent, costly, lethal, and responsive to uh, intervention receive priority funding. However, effective HCV in intervention will require a lot more than, than federal funds. It will require a degree of cooperation between mental health, addictionology, prison and public health, and infectious disease disciplines that has never before been achieved. It will require the development of fully integrated cross-cutting teams that work well together instead of competing at the federal troughs for funds. And unless this type of platform for cooperation is crafted into the wording, uh, funding, propo uh, funding proposals, goals and objectives, the results will be suboptimal. Congress may want to look at allocating funds for HCV training programs in primary care teaching settings, family practice, internal medicine, nurse practitioner, and physician's assistant training programs can easily integrate HCV treatment into existing in-house substance abuse, STD, HIV, and mental illness programs to provide the total package necessary for optimizing clinical outcomes. And graduates from these programs will then go out into the community and provide good service for years to come. On behalf of all the people that have HCV and their families and their friends and the doctors who struggle to treat it, I respectfully implore you Congressman, please help us. We need your help, not just federal funds, but federal leadership, and we need it now. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Jesse. My name is Ann Jesse. Got there. Is a button on there? Yeah, talk right into the microphone, too. Move it close to you. No? Okay. My name is Ann Jesse. I'm both a founding member of the National Hepatitis C Advocacy Council, a national coalition of hepatitis C advocacy organizations, and also the founding director of Hep C Connection, a national nonprofit network support system for people living with hepatitis C. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to once again address this grave public health threat before the Government Reform Committee. I remember well when, shortly after my hepatitis C diagnosis in 1994, former Surgeon General Dr. Everett C. Koop described the hepatitis C epidemic as one of the most significant, preventable, and treatable public health problems facing our nation. At that time, he said, it was a graver threat than the AIDS crisis. Despite the ominous warnings of experts like Dr. Koop and his successor, Dr. David Satcher, the general public, and many people in the healthcare and public health communities still remain uninformed about the threat posed by the current hepatitis C crisis. As early as 1991, Dr. Miriam Alter of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention warned us 
that hepatitis C was a sleeping giant. Although others soon realized the far-reaching personal and societal threats posed by this sleeping giant, the warnings were not acted upon with sufficient rigor to contain a problem of such magnitude. So today we are faced with a public health crisis that is growing day by day. This crisis will continue to grow in destructive capacity for the foreseeable future until we meet this foe with sufficient funds and the rigor to control it. To be sure, the alarm must be sounded. Based on incidence and prevalence data and our current knowledge about the clinical course of hepatitis C, we can expect that of the 5 million people estimated to be infected, at least 1,250,000 will develop cirrhosis, and 125,000 will require liver, liver transplantation for liver failure and or liver cancer. To give you some frame of reference to comprehend the magnitude of these figures, think of the number of people in a city the size of New Orleans, Los Angeles, or San Antonio, Texas. Now try to imagine that every man, woman, and child in the city is suffering from hepatitis C-related cirrhosis of the liver. That is what this treacherous giant called hepatitis C has in store for us, unless we act immediately to intervene in the public health crisis. Another way to comprehend the magnitude of the problem is to consider how the number of people infected with hepatitis C compares to other well-publicized health problems with which we are very familiar. We have the uh, sign over here. HIV is notably absent from this graphic over to my right. The reason is that because of the way HIV AIDS is reported, it is currently not possible to determine how many new infections occur each year. However, according to the CDC, an estimated 570,000 people in the U.S. were living with HIV AIDS in 2003, compared to an estimated 3 to 5 million people living with chronic hepatitis C. I think this is a statistic is always amazing and alarming to the general public. Uh, and we must take control of the crisis and look at integration into pre-existing programs, but this alone is not adequate. The National Hepatitis C Advocacy Council appreciates the fact that there are several individuals in the Department of Health and Human Services who understand the magnitude of the hepatitis C crisis and are willing to dedicate the efforts needed to intervene effectively. However, those of us who understand the urgency of the crisis have been stymied because the response at the federal level to this crisis has thus far been starkly insufficient to deal with the magnitude of the problem. We feel strongly that an effective disease control and prevention program must be tailored to fit the specific characteristics of the disease being targeted. In other words, effective programs are disease specific and take into account the characteristics of the disease such as how it is transmitted, the natural course of the disease, the population at risk, and available treatment options. Herein is a foundational problem with the current DHHS plan, which attempts to address the hepatitis C crisis solely by integrating hep C prevention and control into pre-existing HIV, AIDS, and sexually transmitted diseases programs. Although HCV and HIV have some shared routes of transmission, they are distinctly different viruses and diseases. The risk groups and relative risks of acquiring these two very different viruses from certain activities are simply not the same. An integration-only approach, we feel, is doomed to failure. Should HCV prevention and control efforts be integrated, in, integrated into existing HIV, AIDS, and STD programs? Of course but HCV prevention and control efforts must go far beyond integration if we hope to bring this crisis under control. In terms of the potential costs of the inadequate response, I can assure you that the hepatitis C crisis grows more, serious, more seriously each day. A landmark study published recently by Dr. John Wong, which to whom Dr. Rudd, Rudman referred, laid forth the dire consequences of the currently unchecked hepatitis C crisis. 
He predicted several devastating personal, societal, and fiscal developments. And I believe we have that uh, to our right again. The accuracy of Dr. Wong's predictions are already declaring themselves in the rising rates of chronic liver disease, increased incidence of liver cancer, and increasing demand for liver transplantation. But we were only at the beginning of this devastating course. It will go far worse unless we take immediate action to change the, the current tide. The good news is that we have not yet squandered our opportunity to change the ultimate outcome of this public health crisis. In the past decade, great advances have been made in the treatment of hepatitis C, and with the appropriate therapy, nearly 50 percent of those treated for their disease are able to successfully clear the virus and halt further disease progression. If we act now and successfully identify and treat those at greatest risk for the development of liver failure and or liver cancer, we can save lives, salvage productivity, and ultimately decrease the burden of this disease. Unlike HIV, which requires lifelong antiviral therapy, the treatment for HCV is limited. A successful course of therapy is completed in 24 to 48 weeks. For those who clear the virus, no additional antiviral therapy is required. For all intents and purposes, these patients have been cured of chronic hepatitis C. The bottom line is that identifying and treating hepatitis C is clearly cost effective. And we have those figures again to the right. The Hepatitis C National Advocacy and community-based organizations have put forth heroic efforts to try to provide much-needed prevention and control services, funded virtually exclusively by private fundraising and small non-federal grants the organizations of the National Hepatitis C Advisory Council have, conducted local screening, counseling, and testing programs, worked with corrections facilities to improve Hep C efforts for the incarcerated population, collaborated with harm reduction programs to provide Hep C education to at-risk populations, authored a comprehensive, patient-oriented book about Hep C, and countless other daily efforts by a legion of unsung heroes across the land. We are doing the best we can on what amounts to a wing and a prayer and a passionate commitment to those afflicted with this disease, but we are sadly aware that our efforts are barely scratching the surface of what needs to be done to address the crisis. We, the DHHS agencies, the state, and local health departments and the hepatitis C advocacy organizations must have funding to do the work we know must be done and that we are fully prepared to do. Hepatitis C is everyone's disease. Many of the millions of Americans infected with HCV are average citizens just like you and me, our family members and friends. Middle-aged working class men and women who may have had a blood transfusion due to surgery, injury, or childbirth, young adults who had transfusions as premature babies, military veterans of Vietnam, Desert Storm, and the young men and women coming home from Afghanistan and Iraq, hardworking, productive men and women who experimented briefly with drugs in the folly of their youth and are now paying the price. Unlike most viral diseases, from the common cold to influenza to AIDS to HCV, HCV is a treatable illness. In other words, and like many other afflictions, we have the opportunity to intervene in this crisis with the potential to achieve a viral cure in approximately half of those treated. We have a rare opportunity with HCV, and we must not squander it. I am one of the many faces of hepatitis C, and I stand before you today as one of the lucky ones. Not only am I a treatment veteran, but I'm also a successful responder to treatment for this insidious disease. Unlike so many unsuspecting people infected with hepatitis C, I was fortunate enough to get tested. And unlike many people currently struggling with hepatitis C, I had adequate insurance coverage and was thus able to afford treatment. Above all, I was fortunate to, to have successfully cleared the virus and remained virus-free six years later. In gratitude for my good fortune, 
the misfortune of the millions of others infected with hepatitis C, not to mention the more than two million Americans who are not aware they are infected, that misfortune is never far from my mind. I cannot forget about them, and neither should you. Just as I pled for attention before this same congressional committee in March of 1998, I repeat my plea with even greater passion today. We have a moral, professional, and fiscal responsibility to the American people to act now to implement a federally funded comprehensive hepatitis C prevention and control program. It is not only our responsibility, it is the only humane option possible. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Jesse. Uh, Mr. Nemec, thanks for being with us. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is John Nemec, and I'm a captain with the Fairfax County Fire and Rescue Department. I appear before you today on behalf of my department and the Fairfax County Professional Firefighters and Paramedics International Association of Firefighters, Local 2068, and my colleagues from Fairfax County Sheriff's Office. I would like to thank you, Mr. I would like to thank you, Congressman Davis, and the committee for holding this important hearing today. And I commend you for shining a spotlight on a public health issue that is of vital concern to the nation's firefighters. I would also like to thank Mr. Jay Walker, the students from Robinson High School DECA, and especially Erica Stein for their unselfish campaign in promoting hepatitis C awareness and future legislation. I am here today because Hep C is a real concern for first responders. It is because hepatitis C is transmitted blood to blood, first responders face an, an increased risk of exposure to the virus. Hep C can be a lethal virus that is five times more prevalent here in the state's population compared to the HIV virus, and yet, and yet, the American people receive little information as it relates to the hepatitis C virus. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate that approximately one out of every 50 Americans, that is, one out of every 50 Americans is infected with hepatitis C virus. Individuals who are hep C infected can be asymptomatic up to 20 to 30 years. Often, by the time the disease is even diagnosed, the disease has already progressed to cirrhosis, liver cancer, end-stage liver disease, or the need for a liver transplant. In those cases, it, if it had been caught earlier, there may have been a chance to slow the progression of the disease with the behavior changes such as limiting alcohol consumption. Currently, there is no vaccine for hepatitis C. Often, individuals who were, who were administered the hepatitis A and or the hepatitis B vaccine believe they are protected against hepatitis C. This is not the case. And these misperceptions show that we need a better public education campaign about the disease. It is because the virus consistently mutates. There are six genotypes and over 80 subtypes causing the manufacturing of vaccine for hepatitis C to be problematic. Typically, the treatment regimen is for six to 12 months of injections and oral medications. While treatment has advanced over the last 10 years, more needs to be done. In about 50% of the patients, current treatments do not eliminate the disease. Also, treatment for hep C can cause significant physical and mental side effects, which means the patient receiving treatment may require additional support from medical providers and patient support groups to optimize their treatment outcomes. As mentioned, first responders face an increased risk of exposure to the disease. Hep C has not only infected, but also has affected a number of first responders within the fire service 
and law enforcement arenas. Fairfax County Fire and Rescue currently has 10 firefighters infected with the virus, while the City of Philadelphia Fire Department has over 200 fire service personnel stricken by this disease. On a personal note, I have a younger sibling infected with this virus. The time to educate, prevent, and screen the at-risk population is now. Medical experts with knowledge about this virus continue to echo the urgent need to screen at-risk populations such as first responders and individuals who had blood transfusions prior to 1992. Therefore, I urge that all congressional leaders embrace, promote, and fund the Hepatitis C Epidemic Control and Prevention Act, not only for first responders, but for the American people as well. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any, any and all questions. Thank you very much. Erica, thanks for being with us. You're a cleanup hitter you. here. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Congressman Davis, for everything that you've done for us, and um, Congressman Towns for everything that you've also done for us. Thank you. I was five years old when my father was first diagnosed with hepatitis C. At the time, I really didn't understand what this meant, but I could tell that my mother seemed to be very concerned, and I sensed that something was gravely wrong. By the time I was in fourth grade, my father's physician started him on a course of interferon in hopes of ridding him of the virus. My dad had to give himself painful injections of the drug several times a day, and the drug caused him to become seriously ill. I can remember vividly my dad lying on the couch with a fever of 102 and shivering as if he had a bad case of the flu. During the time my dad was on interferon, he became depressed and seemed like a completely different person to me. The smallest event could cause my dad to literally go ballistic, almost like he had changed into the Incredible Hulk. Our family experienced a great deal of stress and turmoil throughout the interferon treatment, and we were all thankful to reach its end. Although he went through nearly six months of sheer torture, the interferon treatment had no effect on his hepatitis C virus. Needless to say, we were all heartbroken at the fa failure of the treatment. Several years later, my dad became a patient of the HALT-C study and was started on a course of pegylated interferon with ribavirin at the National Institute of Health. Before beginning the treatment, he was given a liver biopsy, and they discovered that he had cirrhosis of the liver. He finished the less painful course of the interferon treatment only to find out, once again, that it had no effect on the virus. My dad felt as if he had failed the treatment, but in truth, the treatment failed him. In the fall of 2003, I was in my advanced marketing class, and we were deciding what we should focus on as a public relations project for the school year. I introduced the idea of doing a project on hepatitis C because it was real life for me, and our Robinson DECA chapter has always dealt with serious issues that impact the lives of people who are greatly loved. We discovered that a bill had been introduced in May of 2003 that would allot $90 million for research and education on the hepatitis C virus. As you know, Congressman Davis, our DECA chapter takes on tough issues. We've worked on the Ricky Ray Hemophilia Relief Fund Act, the Good Samaritan Law, which protects users of automated defibrillators, and most recently, the Dirty Diamonds Act. I learned that Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson had introduced Bill S-1143, so I immediately contacted her office to see what we could do to help. I was then put into contact with Sharon Phillips, president of the Hepatitis C Advocacy Network based in Texas, and she was instantly by our side. She and Lauren Sant of the Hepatitis C Caring Ambassadors Program flew to Virginia and came to educate our advanced marketing class. After Lauren and Sharon's powerful visit, where we learned that four million Americans were infected with hepatitis C and 10,000 Americans die each year of the virus, our chapter unanimously decided that hepatitis C would be our public relations project. Since October of 2003, nearly 500 marketing students from Robinson Secondary School have been working on Capitol Hill, visiting congressional offices, and persuading health LAs to encourage their members to co-sign the Wilson Towns Hepatitis C Epidemic Control and Prevention Act, HR 3539. We have letters, 
phone calls, and emails of encouragement from hundreds of hepatitis C patients across the country. I have a story to tell you concerning some of the frustrations that come along with explaining hepatitis C to the public. A year ago this month, 80 Robinson marketing students went to New York City for our annual, annual marketing field study. We planned a side trip at 5 a.m. to visit Rockefeller Center and be a part of the studio audience of the Today Show. Of course, being the good marketing students, we couldn't miss the opportunity to promote our five fruits and vegetables a day campaign, our child safety civic consciousness project, and of course, the hepatitis C public relations campaign. Each student was manned with a poster, except only five posters out of the 80 were allowed into the Today Show fenced in area. We were told, the Today Show has a family audience, and the sexually oriented hepatitis C thing would not be appropriate for the audience. Security literally threw away our posters because they thought hepatitis C is a sexually transmitted, dirty disease. Chairman Davis, when we began this project a year ago, no one wanted to talk about hepatitis C. Even a congressional aide told one of our students that the number of recorded deaths from, from his state who are infected with hepatitis C was not enough to pass a bill. Just one death is too many. The American people have the right to know about the silent epidemic. Our government needs to be proactive so we are not caught off guard like we were with the HIV AIDS virus in the 1980s. In this audience today, our representatives from the hemophiliac community know all too well about viruses that are spread through our blood supply. Our DECA chapter spent seven years working on the Ricky Ray Bill with hemophiliacs like Ella Sulcer and Dana Kuhn, who are currently co-infected with hepatitis C and HIV. Will our generation have a chance to survive hepatitis C? The answer is yes, Chairman Davis, if we can stimulate research and education during the 109th session of Congress. Chairman Davis, as I close my speech, I would like to say, I know you're here representing your constituents, and we believe you care about Americans like my father, Gene Stein. If we don't provide some funding for research and education for hepatitis C, it will impact each and every one of our lives. Thank you. Erica, thank you very much. Thanks. I'm going to start, uh, Mrs. Norton. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I think probably uh, this, is, this question is best uh, uh, is, is best the, uh, offered to Dr. Rudman. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find evidence of some um, federal involvement commensurate with this disease. Um, your your clinic is it a clinic uh, has um, an annual budget of sixty to $70,000 a year and you have one full-time uh, employee, et cetera. How much of that is federal funding? We have no federal funding. We have no state funding. Um, the only funding that we have on a governmental level is local from our uh, Board of County Commissioners. What is, how is that? No federal funding and no state funding. Have you tried to get funding from either of these two entities? Yes. Um, actually, uh, our, our little clinic uh, got together with uh, our jail and our STD clinic and our sexually transmitted disease clinic and our hospital and our mental health uh, pro programs and, and our emergency room and our inpatient psychiatric treatment ward and Johns Hopkins uh, University's top scientists. And uh, we came up with a grant uh, proposal uh, for a $447,000 uh, viral integration project. And uh, it turns out that w we were actually awarded uh, a half a oh, $447,000 grant, but then the funding for that project was cut and we never received it's a anything. grant from, from whom? C CDC. When was that? That was the, earlier this year. And, and, and so the entire grant was, was cut away? Uh, it was a $3.5 million grant, uh, and they advertised it for seven programs. We were one of the seven programs that was approved, 
And then uh, what happened was uh, the funding was cut in half, and uh, we were cut in the you know in the final cut. So, so we was were this for treatment. Was this for treatment? Was yes. this for surveillance? This was for prevention of uh, hepatitis A and B uh, in at-risk populations and hepatitis C. We were also screening for HIV, but we would have been probably the only program that actually offered treatment for hepatitis C. So that C. So that made us kind of special. Well do do any of you know any programs in Maryland and Virginia, I know of none in the District of Columbia, uh, private or public, uh, which are geared toward this the population who may get or who have uh, HIV, I'm sorry, hepatitis C? Well, that's the point uh, I'm trying to, I've tried to I mean, make. Are you the only program in Maryland? I'm afraid so. And, uh, and that is a, that is a, uh, that's a very sad thing. Is there any Maryland. program that you know of in Virginia? Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, that, uh, I, 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 was, I was just trying to, <laughs> trying to find traces of public health involvement in what turns out to be a public health menace that you have uncovered with this hearing. We've heard today uh, that 60% 60, 60 of, of the HIV, 60% uh, uh, 60 of those with hepatitis C are HIV drug users. We've heard testimony that many of them are in prison, and we've heard testimony that that the outreach consists of things like going online and posters. Um, I, I, I'm afraid um, that the problem here is not the disease, but perhaps who gets the disease. This is exactly the, this was exactly the problem with the HIV AIDS, precisely the problem with HIV AIDS, until a little boy, a little white boy, and a wonderful poster child got HIV AIDS. We didn't wake America up to what now everybody embraces, that whoever has the disease um, deserves our help. And if you don't believe that, do understand that you're not going to quarantine them from society. And we learned that the hard way as, as, as AIDS got into our blood supply. And uh, now, of course, nobody identifies AIDS with um, gay people. It's, uh, it's all across the board, and that's exactly what is, is going to happen here. It's not going to be identified uh, with people who've been in jail or people who are drug users. And I don't think we should have to wait for a poster child to deal with the disease so that we have zero funding in, in this tri-state uh, area on the part of, of public health funding. Uh, so I think what we're dealing with here, Mr. Chairman, is a second-class disease. Um, and I say so because I was shocked until um, uh, um, uh, your staff uh, told me why it could possibly be that you had to have HIV AIDS uh, in order to get treated for hepatitis C. You know, so counterintuitive, not true. And she, told, she said, but it's probably because the funding stream mm -hmm. is available only from HIV, and nobody has put a red cent into separately funding uh, hepatitis C. We've got to do something about that. I'm, very, I'm pleased that we can get some money from some place, but we've got to do something about this. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I, I can't thank you enough for your leadership. You certainly have awakened my consciousness by hoping this hearing. I hope... Uh, that based on what you have uncovered in this hearing, we will resolve to do for hepatitis C what the country has now done for HIV AIDS. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think the people before us today uh, have done, um, you know, more than we have. They've really brought it, I think, teed it up for us. The rest of it's going to be up to us in terms of how we can follow through, what legislation we can pass, and what we can do in terms of awareness. Uh, Mr. Towns has been a, a real leader in this. He's been ahead of the pack. Um, so I do recognize for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your kind words. Um, Dr. Rudman, um, the panel before you said that every state had a coordinator except, I think, South Dakota and Kentucky. 
They didn't say Marilyn didn't have one. Um, that may be because he didn't know that Marilyn's, uh, Marilyn did have one, but, but she was fired. Um, for, I think for doing a good job. Um, you see, not every state wants a hepatitis C coordinator because that's going to make people want to spend state dollars to take care of disease in local communities. And people who run budgets say, well, we'll have to take away money from other projects or we have to raise taxes. So we don't want people to know about this disease. And that's what we're running into. Um, it, it's almost as if it were a secret that they don't want to get out. Um, and so the Department of, our Department of Health does not have one person working, one person in the entire state health department working on hepatitis C. And, and there is some discouragement, I think, uh, in, get, in talking about it because they'll say, well, we can't do anything about this anyway. We don't have any money. So it's a nice thing to have good projects and all these state plans. I've looked at state plans all over the country, which is what I do for, for the state of Maryland. We're reviewing other plans. Having a plan doesn't mean anything unless you have the funds to implement them. And that's the problem. We have a plan in Maryland uh, and we have 39 action points on it and we've implemented six of them. And those six we would have had to implement for other reasons anyway. So we have actually implemented actually zero uh, hepatitis C uh, action plans. And I think other states are having the same problem. You know, uh, we need clear guidelines that are, are ethical and legally defensible and, um, and scientifically sound, but we also need funds to implement them. And the states are strapped. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Redmond. Uh, let me say, I really appreciate the testimony of all of you. I really do. But I just want to single Eric, Erica out, you know, because you know how we feel about, and many of people talk about young people not doing anything positive. But Erica, I want you to know you touched me. The fact that you're involved in this issue in the fashion that you're involved in it. You know, I tell you, I wish the media was fair. The night you'd be the leading thing on every news station throughout the United States of America because of what you're doing in such a positive way. So I want to say I salute you and I thank you for your support of our legislation. I really appreciate that as well. So continue to do and eventually, eventually I think that if uh, uh, enough people hear us that somebody is going to get the message. I think that uh, my son said to me and that I, I think it's appropriate to comment on it here. He said sometimes it takes some people uh, two and a half hours to watch 60 Minutes. <laughs> Doesn't mean they can't watch it. It takes them a lot longer. So I think sometimes it takes our country a lot longer to understand where we need to go and what we need to be about. So I want to thank you all for coming here today and just saying to you, do you have any suggestions or recommendations for us, the members of Congress, that we might be able to sort of pursue? Uh, I've, I would just like to spend my last few seconds here hearing from you on that issue. I would really say that um, encouraging other members of Congress to co-sign on the bill and, you know, even on the Senate side to get people on the Senate side to sign on to the bill because, as you can see, it's vital that um, we have the funding to do the things that we need to do. Um, and really, I think the biggest problem here is the American public isn't aware of this. Like, something needs to be done about this. I don't know, you know, what you have to do, but I don't think that it's going to be effective by doing posters and brochures. Something more needs to be done, and I don't think that it should be necessary that we need a poster child for it to go along with a disease. It shouldn't be that way. When you see that every, you know, an average American is being diagnosed with this, like my father has no idea how he contracted it. He never used drugs. And the only reason he found out that he had it was because he was getting a new life insurance policy. So. It just people need to be aware of it. It's not fair to the American public that they don't know what's going on. I think it's only fair that people know, you know, what it is and how you can get it. I didn't hear anyone testify that about 40 percent 
of the HIV-infected individuals are co-infected with hepatitis C, about 40 percent. And within our arena, in the emergency care, very chaotic, unsterile, uncontrolled environment, where a firefighter, EMT, EMS personnel sustains a dirty needle stick, the current stats out there, according to the CDC, is that individual has anywhere from a zero to seven percent risk of now contracting hepatitis C. And bear in mind, bear in mind that currently there's no post-exposure prophylaxis. For HIV, if I have a dirty needle stick, there's medications out there called the HIV cocktail. And as long as I get the cocktail on board within a, a certain amount of time, it's not 100, it's not 100 percent efficacious, but yet it's going to reduce my chances of contracting HIV. I've heard nothing. I've seen nothing as it relates to a firefighter, EMS personnel, sustaining a dirty needle stick. Currently, there's no recommendations from CDC with PEP. So if I have a dirty needle stick, and if I reside in a state that's fortunate enough to have a deemed consent, in other words, I have access to that source patient's blood for HIV, Hep B, and Hepatitis C, I may not know whether or not if that patient is infected with hepatitis C, and not only if I do find out that the individual is serial positive for hep C, there's nothing to do about it other than sit and wait. So a lot needs to be done. A lot needs to be done. Do you have enough, enough time to answer? Yes, sure. He, no, Just a, a comment, and I think this goes to the educational problems. Uh, most doctors don't know this, but if you have acute hepatitis C, that is new onset hepatitis C, you could treat it with six months of interferon alone, and current uh, studies indicate that up to 97 percent of the cases will be cured. Uh, this comes from Stephen Mann's work out in Germany, where 43 out of 44 patients were, were cured, and we're presently doing that with our acute cases. Uh, with a needle stick uh, injury, uh, that may be one of the only situations where you're going to identify an acute hepatitis C case because usually it doesn't have any symptoms. So if you watch carefully uh, and signs of hepatitis uh, occur and they don't resolve by themselves, then there, there, there really should be a post-exposure uh, uh, treatment program in place. Thank you. Why it doesn't push on? Okay. Uh, to get behind <laughs> us passionate advocates try to get the public aware of this disease to make them aware that it is everybody's disease it can affect you and your friends and people like me and try to break the stigma and I think another thing that I constantly work with with my organization is to try to make people aware that um, there are possibly five million people infected in the US and that more than half of them aren't aware of this and so help us get risk factors uh, distributed so people can start self-identifying because if you are infected, you need to press on with this. So do what you can to help us with education and then help us get the funding to move on with this very important work. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Let me ask Kurt just a couple questions. I mean, it's like the Fram oil filter guy says, you can pay me now or pay me later. If you don't stop this and it keeps spreading, it just becomes much more difficult to, uh, you know, further down the road. Um, Erica, let me ask this. When you discuss hepatitis C with the average person, what, what's the reaction you get? A lot of them have no idea what it is. A lot of, I know when we first introduced it to our class, kids were saying that they had had their vaccine for it. There's no vaccine, vaccine. for it, and it, it's very common that you come um, across people who just have absolutely no idea what it is or they can't decipher between hepatitis A and B and C. So they have no idea what it is or how serious it is and how, you know, easily it can be contracted. Yeah. And you'd be the last person to stand up here and make this the Erica Stein show. You really have a team behind you, don't you? have your classmates at Robinson that have been so active in, uh, yeah. in this. I know they've been all over Capitol Hill and, and everything yes. else. Uh, and, and it makes a difference. I, legislation moves very slowly sometimes. Yeah. I've been working on some bills for since I got here 10 years ago. Uh, and but we don't give up, and, and uh, I think this next session we have a shot at doing at doing some. Uh, but time runs out on this one because yeah. every year more people get infected. Right. Um, Dr. Rudman, um, 
do you feel people who come to you, that, that if you can get a hold of them and have the resources, that you can get a pretty high cure rate out of it? Uh, that's what's really interesting and, and, and perhaps sad, because the people that I see are really sick. Uh, and when you look at some of the clean studies that are done, 16 or 13 percent of the people have severe liver disease when they're entered into random uh, trials. I, I'm running 48 percent. So our people are a lot sicker, and yet our cure rates, even with all of that fibrosis, are as high as what they get in those clean studies. So if you have a team that, ad that motivates patients and cares about them, uh, even these tough patients, uh, you, can, you can get them cured. And we're able, thanks to uh, Shering Plow and, and Roche, to actually get uh, free drugs for these people. So, uh, but you have to have all the other support available to, to give them the drugs, and that's what we were able, successfully able to do in our community. Um, we need to let yeah. more people know about this and replicate it. Uh, we just need a lot I more think, of You know, we designed it to be a model, and mm -hmm. so we're trying, that's one of the reasons we're here, is to try to, you know, to get the word out that this can be treated in, at the local level and in communities, but we certainly do need more federal uh, support and funding. I'd, I'd note that NIH has stayed here to hear your, this, and I know they were interested in responding. I mean, they want to, they want to help. Uh, our job here is to help make sure that they've got some resources along the way. Captain Nemec, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that 10 people, I think, in Fairfax uh, County Fire and Rescue have hepatitis C and there are other departments across the country having similar or higher numbers. Is this on the rise? Really unfortunate, Chairman, that law enforcement and fire service arenas are not doing any testing, aren't doing anything. A lot of that is because education, awareness, funding, but moreover, if that firefighter, if that police officer is now hepatitis C infected, who takes care of him or her? Whose problem? And this is one of the things I've heard echoed over and over and over again. We don't want to screen. We don't want to test because if that firefighter, if that police officer comes up hep C positive, whose problem does he or she become? Do you think many of them are, are getting this because of their just job related, in other words, for the most part? Yes, sir, that is correct. So that may be something uh, you want to run down to the legislature, at least, uh, on the, uh, like you would do with heart, and lung, and so on, to make sure at least they're taken care of. And uh, that's. Uh, we I are very it. unique within Fairfax County. Uh, latter part of 1999 through calendar year 2000, we did a comprehensive screening process with 1,200 plus of our firefighters, and of those firefighters, we had 10 who came up hepatitis C positive. Every year, we're, we are doing our required under OSHA our bloodborne pathogens yeah. training. It's disquieting and most chilling that a lot of departments out there, a lot of your first responders are not receiving this training, nor are they getting any type of screening. And we know that they are at risk every single day he or she puts on that uniform and goes out to the streets. Yeah. We know that. Well, you give me a lot of ideas just hearing the, about the seriousness of this. And as we start monitoring this, it's, uh, you know, nationally this has just been fairly recently monitored. We can check the rise, but hopefully we can uh, uh, take some uh, uh, so some actions that can curb that. I, I just want to thank all of you for being here. I think you add a lot. Uh, these, these have been televised to today on, on C-SPAN. Uh, but more importantly, our committee will follow up with the appropriate uh, reports. Uh, we have to work with other committees of jurisdiction on funding and the like. Uh, I know Mr. Towns isn't, uh, isn't discouraged. Uh, he's going to keep trying, and I'm going to try to keep helping him. We'll be looking for new ways. So hopefully we made a small difference today, and I just want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here. And for all of the Robinson uh, kids, uh, the DECA group over there, this is one in a series of different uh, uh, um, causes that they've adopted through time, and they weren't here for Ricky Ray and some of the other issues. It took several years. Uh, but I just appreciate uh, their, their can-do spirit on there, and I think it's uh, contagious on all of us. So we appreciate it all, and thank all of you for continuing your advocacy. Hearings adjourned.
More live events later today. On C-SPAN 2, the Nixon Center hosts Mikhail Baryshnikov. He'll talk about the Cold War and present-day Russia. That's live at 7.30 p.m. C-SPAN 2. And tonight at 8, back here.